Hello, polywogs and jumbo frogs. I am he who is known as Gonellock, and today I bring you a cohesive history of the lovable and huggable subgenre known as death metal. There's debate regarding where exactly death metal started geographically, but no matter where you choose to believe it's from, death metal was the next step up from thrash metal in terms of extremity. Once the thrashers of the early 80s made their revelation that thrash is trash, young blood was eager to move in with the next big thing. Something faster, heavier, and scarier, like a morbidly obese Sonic the Hedgehog, something that came to be known as death metal. The geographic debate generally boils down to either Sweden or America, the latter most often being favored because the grand old USA is what gave birth to Possessed, who in turn gave birth to their 1984 demo titled Death Metal. This is where the name Death Metal comes from. But if you really need further proof, let's break it down this way. Sweden has ABBA, the Moomins, and strange genetically anomalous sea life. Not bad, but not exactly what springs to mind when you imagine the rough and wild hellscape that would be needed to breed something as perverse and depraved as death metal. America, on the other hand, has Regina Spectre, the Muppets, and alligators. Need I say more? Yes, these alligators are primarily found in Florida, where they collaborated with local musicians to develop some of the biggest names in death metal today. Morbid Angel released Altars of Sadness, Death released Scream Bloody Gore, Obituary released a compilation of stolen Celtic Frost riffs, and, hmm, I can't decide which Deicide album to showcase. There's too many stellar releases to pick from between Jingle Bells God Smells, Shut Up God, and, ew, who invited Jesus? Despite their importance to the scene's beginning, though, the alligators only really got recognition from the band Nile. My point here, anyway, is that the United States had an amazing foundation for death metal. But I am not discrediting the Swedish death metal scene, I'm just saying that they weren't exactly first. The Swedes had their own little legion to kickstart their local scene, and these Scandinavian sweethearts had a lot of respect for punk music for some reason, and allowed it to seep into their death metal. These punky death pioneers included Nihilist, later known as Entombed, later, uh, no, that's it, actually. There was also Carnage, Dismember, Unleashed, who, despite the misleading name, did not release Who Let the Dogs Out, Grave, and a bowl of meatballs someone left next to a tape recorder overnight. One of the staples of the Swedish scene that continues to define the sound today is the use of the HM2 pedal, which is the musical equivalent of sandpaper, in a, a good way. But overseas, things in America were just getting started. The talk of the time was all about manifest destiny and westward expansion. History buffs will already know that one of the most appealing parts of moving out west was the incredible amount of land you had access to. You could build massive farms for relatively cheap, and where there are farms, there are barns. Chris Barnes, to be exact, the vocalist of Cannibal Corpse, the first band in the western expansion scene. The name Cannibal Corpse is derived from one of the most common settler dinners, known as haggis. It involves filling an animal stomach, usually a sheep or a cow, with fillings that included other parts of that same animal. So it was almost like the corpse was cannibalizing the other bits and pieces. Not only did the band name reflect their pioneer lifestyle, but it seeped into their music as well. Death metal up until this point was generally about extreme violence or horror movies with a healthy sprinkle of blasphemy on top, but Cannibal Corpse was already bringing on a revolution. They went all out on the farm theme, and it sold beyond anyone's wildest imagination. Releases like The Feeding, Tomb of the Mutilated, and Wheat and Bags of Rice brought them fortune and fame. Chris Barnes was sheriff, and no one dared question him or Cannibal Corpse. Until a stranger wandered into town. Cannibal Corpse was mid-performance. They were playing their new song, Entrails Ripped from a Virgin's House. The name's George, the man said. George... Horse Rider Fisher. Barnes was taken aback, but he had to defend what he had built. Oi, 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 said Chris, with a hint of fear in his voice. What he meant was, what do you want, thick neck? George replied with the gusto and bravado that we all know him for today. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. I'm going to put you six feet under. Chris Barnes was afraid that Horse Rider was going to kill him. But, unfortunately, that's not what he meant. Barnes was left with a fate far worse than death. Speaking of worse things, Sweden lit the flame of melodic death metal, which would go on to be one of the most popular subgenres in the entire world of extreme music. 
At the gates in dark tranquility were among the first offenders in what is now called Ground Zero, or Gothenburg. Melodic death, or mellow death for those who want to waste even less of a breath on this disgrace of a subgenre, is still thriving today with acts like Amana Marth, the black dilated Mormon, and hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is especially relevant because I actually love melodic death metal, it's just very easy to make fun of. But that's not to suggest that the old school sound of Sweden is dead. No, sir, those bands like Gluttony, Under the Church, and Entrails, which canonically takes place before they were ripped from a virgin's house. America experienced a similar shift. There's modern death metal, which is usually more technical, see bands like Sleeping Babies and Atheist, but there's also plenty of acts dedicated to old school death metal. American examples would be Horrendous, Necrot, and Rip to Shreds, which is probably the most famous old school death metal style band right now, and for good reason, wink wink. But while the two countries I've mentioned are undoubtedly the powerhouses of death metal, some fantastic acts have come from other places. The less interesting sequel to Germany gave us a sphix and pestilence and same-sex marriage as early as 2001. England offered Bolt Thrower and subsequently Memoriam. Finland has Depravity. They also have a band called Depravity over there. Death Metal is actually very diverse in terms of where it comes from. There are many individual scenes to dive into, which I may do in future videos. The hip new buzzword disguised as a subgenre for right now is Cavern Death. Cavernous death metal is a specific sound that is especially claustrophobic and grimy, and usually a bit more mid-paced. That sounds really bad, but I promise you, negative adjectives usually mean praise when it comes to death metal. If someone tells you an album is the most disgusting thing they've ever heard, that's a recommendation. Now, with death metal, I guess the only major thing left that I want to say in regards to history is the massive push for censorship on this style of music. Not necessarily an organized push, unless you want to count Tipper Gore and her Legion of Doom, but generally speaking, a lot of people don't take kindly to extreme art. Whether it's the obscene album artwork, the graphic lyrics, vulgar t-shirt designs, or tasteless camouflage shorts, there will always be someone or something trying to stop it from being seen. There are countless places and situations in which, yes, death metal and all related imagery is wildly inappropriate, but that doesn't mean you should give up on your passion altogether. In the words of Professor Grass, there's a time and a place for everything. But not in your high school English class.